Welcome back to the latest episode of the Flex Success Podcast, where we teach you how to be less shit. As always, we will be your co-hosts. I'm Lizzie, and this is Dean. Now, if you find value in this episode, be sure to give us a like, subscribe, and drop a comment below on YouTube. Share us with your friends. Give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. And if you want to take a screenshot and tag us on Instagram, just do that by putting in at flex underscore success. And while you're on Instagram, you can check out everything we offer from our eBooks to courses and programs. You can book a consultation or inquire about coaching via the link in our bio, or you can do that on our website. Enjoy the episode. So good to see you guys again. Hello. Who are you even looking at? I'm just, look, I'm talking to the camera, <laughs> but. <laughs> this is what it's going to be like in 2060, though. We'll be talking to AI. No more personal relationships, just only conversations to cameras. Oh, if anyone is concerned about AI, you definitely, I have some books in mind for you that will terrify you, actually, but also open your mind to the potential of AI. And that is 21 Lessons of the 21st Century. This other book I read recently too, actually I did this one on an audiobook, which was um, Sex, Robots and Vegan Meat. Oh my God. What else? There's a hot topic for later on, vegan meat. Um, okay. Spoiler alert, I'm down for it. <laughs> uh, anyways, let's get on with it. We have, I think, a really practical um, topic for you today, and we are going to talk about how to test your metabolism because we always hear people say, I can't lose weight, I have a slow metabolism. It's like saying, I don't know, I, um, what is it like, Dean? I can't save money without actually having a way to plan or test it. So we're going to show you how to do a little scientific experiment on yourself, how to test your metabolism, or at least in the way that people talk, I hate this word, colloquially mm. about metabolism. I, I won't know, repeat it. I know I can't say that word. Um, yeah, because when we actually say metabolism in science, it's like we don't really mean how we don't really mean how people usually talk about it. Yeah, like people generally just speak about metabolism as in it's like, ah, I've got a slow one or I've got a fast one and they think it means that their body is shutting down. And Something like that, yeah. Whatever or they're talking about how many calories they can tolerate before weight gain occurs, mm. which is like we're just going to talk about metabolism like that today. Mm. But before we get there, Dean, personal update. How are you, mate? Oh, bro, you're good. <laughs> good. Does anybody else out there find it a bit weird or gross when their significant other calls them a bro? I think it's kind of weird, yeah. But we're doing it for the lols, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, You're in not this my instance, mate. it was fine, but... Yeah, okay. I mean, sometimes you call me McKillop. I do call you McKillop. I know. Do you think that's weird? And often I call you names that we won't repeat on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't really find it weird. If you called me Dino, I'd find that weird. Dino. Yeah. It's very Australian. Yeah, so personal update. Personal update, we are in Istanbul. Um, in what part of Istanbul? Shishli. Hey. Next to Nishantashi. Yeah, not Nisantasi. No, we were calling it Nisantasi because we're fucking tourists and have no idea how to pronounce Turkish words, apparently. <laughs> Joke's on us because we have often played this game. And I think we've done on the podcast where you pronounce things as weirdly as possible. Yeah. You know, like there's a place in, in Brisbane, Australia called uh, Kapalaba, or it could be Kapalaba. It could be you know. Molindina, Molindala. Yeah. yeah. You just added an extra L, but whatever. Oh, did I? Yeah. Well, when I first arrived in the Gold Coast, because I grew up in Sydney, but spent the last five or six years on the Gold Coast, there's a lot of Aboriginal names, and I don't know how to pronounce any of them because I'm not from the area. And so I would say things like Molin Molindala. Hang on, which is the right one? I forget. Molindina. I right. Think. Okay. I would say Molindala. People are like, well, where? I was like, I don't know. It starts so with an M and ends in an R. Figure it out. <laughs> But it's true, like we were saying to our host at um, our last place in, in uh, Chile, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, our new place is in Nisantasi, and they were just like, where? Yeah. And then I was like, oh, like, I feel like this makes sense. It's spelled N-I-S-A-N-T-A-S-I. In Nisantasi. How else would you pronounce it? And she's like, ah, Nishantasi. And I was like, ah. <laughs> because in the Turkish language, they use, you know, the A to Z alphabet, but they also have, like, um, a normal C and then a C with a couple of dots above it and like a normal U but with a little swiggle under it and stuff like that. So they have um, some accented letters. Mm. So a C with the dots is a sh. It's, it's, a squiggle with, it's a squiggle with the C and a double dot on the U. Oh, I don't know, something like that. So we're just reading a C with dots and squiggles as like a normal C, whereas they would pronounce it as a ch or a sh or something yeah. like that. So 
Yeah, fun fact. Excuse me, Turkish people. I'm so sorry. So Turkey, well, Istanbul has been a it's been fun so far. We were off to a rough start because we hired this apartment for a month, but the management company that we hired this accommodation through have put us through the ringer. <laughs> uh, they double booked and then the aircon wasn't working. We're on the eighth floor with no lift, and we have like 35 kilo bags and just look, communication. We couldn't figure out how to check in and it was a bit of a nightmare. But now that we're here, uh, we're settled. We're looking forward to doing more touristy things because we were going to check out the Blue Mosque. Uh, what's that? Sophia or something or other? Sophia. Hagia. But it's, they Hagia. call it like Hagia. Yeah, something something like that. That. The cistern. There's all these big tourist things that we were going to do on the weekend. But when we arrived, we didn't really feel like lining up in queues that were going to take a few hours. We didn't realise we had to get there so early. We thought we were there early enough. But we were not. So, alas, we will be going later. Tomorrow morning, probably. Yeah, tomorrow morning. Mm. Yeah. Which will so, be like three days ago when this podcast goes live. Mm. Yeah. So that's been a personal fun. update. It Istanbul is mental. I, mean, oh, I would describe Istanbul as overwhelming. Mm. It's massive. There is something everywhere and there is also lots of the same things repeated everywhere. Yeah. So you walk down the street and there's maybe five or six different types of shops and there's about a million shops on every block. Mm. So there's like, what, six corner stores, six bakeries that all sell the same biscuits. There's way too many sweet stores here for the amount of people that are in Istanbul, even though there's millions. Yeah, It's crazy how many stores are dedicated to honey and nut variations of fried phyllo pastry. It's true. <laughs> you know what would be, I'd be interested to look at the, the sort of body weight and composition stats of Turkey because... It's clearly not as uh, disproportionately skewed towards obesity as what America is. Mm -hmm. And yet the availability of highly palatable calorie dense food here is hot. Like most meats are high fat. Mm -hmm. All rice dishes are mixed with oil. Yeah, that's true. Most vegetables are fried, fried or in oil. Yeah. You know? uh, like we said, there's pastry places left, right, and center everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, um, they drink less soft drink and heaps of black tea. There's definitely not as many sugar-free soft drink options here, though. Yeah, that's true. Really shitty energy drink um, availability. Oh, one thing they do drink. What's that yogurt drink called? Uh, Iran. Iran. Yeah. So it's a watered down. Not yogurt. to be confused for Aryan. No, not to be confused with Aryan. Although it's spelled similar. Mm. Yeah. Um, watered down yogurt with salt. Yeah. It's gross. We try, I was like, oh, there's people. Oh, it's not gross. I think it's gross. It just tastes like liquid yogurt, which is kind of weird. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, there, there's certainly no, like, majorly obese individuals here. There's more obese stray dogs. Yeah, so the homeless people are skinny and the stray animals are fat. Like, they're just proper fat. Like, there was this one dog yesterday. Do you remember her? I took a photo from mm -hmm. the top. She... She may be pregnant. I, I don't no, think she's, she's pregnant. No, she's not pregnant. She's so fat she could hardly walk across the street. Like mm. the people really feed the stray animals here, dogs and cats. There's um, dog food and cat food all over the city, water bowls for them everywhere. People have out uh, little dog and cat homes mm. for them to sleep in. They don't. They sleep on the street. Maybe in winter they go in there or something because it snows here. It gets quite cold. But people really look after the animals and ignore the homeless people. Yeah, so what I was, so it is true. But what yeah. I was going to get at, I guess, is that I think the the culture around food here is obviously very different to that uh -huh. of America. Okay, speculation. So, yeah, far, like the, there's an abundance of food available, just like there is in America. Highly caloric food. Yeah, yeah, but, and also like a fairly, excuse my French, but a fucking good collection of chocolates and chips. Oh, yeah. More chocolates and chips. Um, and yet not as apparently uh, negatively associated with, body fat here mm, yeah or total body weight yeah you know. i mean it, it's just off what we've seen mm. uh but it is true there seems to be less obese people than in america the one variable i'm sure there's plenty but the one that sticks out to me right now is we know that food variety is correlated with a higher bmi so the more variety of food in someone's diet, the higher their BMI, generally speaking. But here, even though there's tons of sweets, there's like six or seven stores on one block that sell sweets. They're all selling the same thing. So variety is smaller. Mm. And maybe because people aren't like, oh, that's new. That's exciting. I'll have this. I'll have that. They're sort of eating the same sweets, the same high fat meats, the same vegetables covered in oil it's just not as exciting so there's some palate fatigue going on mm -hmm. what do you think 
Yeah, I also think there seems to be a uh, more of a community family orientated eating culture here there's less snacking on the as an individual yeah okay more like sort of you know sit down have a meal together i also am under the assumption that they probably eat less frequently but larger quantities per meal that seems to be the case um and thus the calories are controlled from that frequency perspective especially if they're not snacking in between meals because you know how easy it is to snack calories into a surplus no scientific conclusions here all speculation Mm. but um yeah cool Cool, 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 cool. No worries, Jake. No worries. (laughs) Now, um, before we go on to the content, I wanted to give a big shout out to all the coaches that have taken up the, we recently, if you've listened to the last episode or two, revamped the macro tracking course. And we've had a lot of coaches since the revamping of said course. Uh, make it part of the onboarding process for their clients. And we've had heaps of great feedback that it's saved them a ton of time and effort having to teach macro tracking, um, having to answer questions, having to go over inaccuracies and holes in people's skills and understanding. They're like, it's so great. I can just send this to my client. They do the course and it's all done. So um, you're welcome. (laughs) And also thanks for the great feedback. It is really nice to hear um, how we've been able to benefit you and save you time because obviously it's there was a lot of time and effort put into the course. So to have that feedback has been, mm. what's the word I'm looking for? Satisfying? Yes, rewarding. Yeah, it's been rewarding. Exactly. Any other? I can't think of any other synonyms. No, Dean. I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. <laughs> All right. So let's get on to the meat and veg of today's podcast, mm. which is do I have a slow metabolism? We're going to teach you how to test it. Uh, because it is unhelpful to just say, I have a slow metabolism, I can't lose weight. Even if it is true that you do, you still can. It just means that your caloric tolerance is lower. Mm -hmm. So how can we go ahead and uh, fact check the claim, I have a slow metabolism? How can we test it, Dean? Well, first, we should probably understand what's included within this metabolism that we're the way that we're talking about, about it. in regards to individuals. Right. Okay. So, so we can break it down into four components. Mm-hmm. Um, we can classify this, the four components as total daily energy expenditure. So these are the four ways that we expend energy, AKA burn calories. Mm-hmm. Would you like to, should I? No, I mean, one of them. Okay. How about you do two? I'll do two. Sure. Uh, <laughs> physical activity. Okay. Or you'll see the acronym PAL, like your pal. Yep. Physical um, activity level. Yep. So that that would be referring to any calories burned doing some form of formal exercise. Okay. Doesn't have to be for the purpose of burning calories. No. But rather it is formal. You're specifically doing exercise. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. So physical activity levels. Are we going one for one? Let's go one. Okay. Then we've got TEF the thermic effect of food. So this is the heat created or the energy burnt through the process of digestion. Uh, We can think of calories in three baskets. We've got the calories taken up from protein and about 30% or up to 30%, I should say, of those calories are burnt off through this component of TDE, total daily energy expenditure. For carbs, it's like up to 10 that number changes depending on what research you look at. And for fats, up to 3%. Mm, not okay. burning many calories eating that their fat. No, sorry. But how does keto work? work? How does keto maybe, work? Maybe for another time. <laughs> um, yeah, topic for another podcast. I also think you should take on NEAT and do that one now. And then I will do BMR because it ties in nicely how to measure it. Let's do it. Okay, so right now we're talking about the four components that make up your energy expenditure, which is called your total daily energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. We've spoken about PAL, we've spoken about TEF, and then you want me to do NEAT, which Mm -hmm. stands for, it's an acronym for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. This is the energy expended through movement that is not formal activity. So think the calories you burn from scratching your head, um, vigorous masturbation, Mm. perhaps (laughs) vacuuming the house, do you reckon you'd burn more calories if you used your non-dominant hand because it would be inefficient? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say you would. We need to, we need to commission a study on that. <laughs> you want, if you want to maximise calorie burn through masturbation, make sure you change hands so that you don't drive up exercise efficiency. I like it. Because that is one thing. That is, that is another thing. Um, what would be another? I mean, if you have a, like a physical job, 
we could probably we could consider that neat because that's not formal exercise. Yeah. yeah. So that's similarly like you know a stay at home mum who does no work. Mm-hmm. You're right. Okay. <laughs> I was definitely just poking. <laughs> and um, the fourth component of energy expenditure is BMR, mm-hmm. basal metabolic rate, mm-hmm. or RMR, resting metabolic rate. One and the same, tested slightly different. Yeah. Um, and, and this is accounting for the energy that your body burns to sustain life outside of the other things that we've spoken about. So cell, yeah. communication, cell communication, organ function, organ function respiration, yeah. brain function, part of an organ. So that goes under there. Yeah. Um, and we can actually test for this. So BMR is also the dominant calorie provider to this equation of total daily energy expenditure. Yeah. So if we think of the four components in a pie chart, the calories that you burn from BMR will take up a large portion of that pie chart. For most people, um, physical activity level only take up a small slice. If you're a professional athlete, you're training twice a day, you know, a little bit larger but very few people would be matching their BMR. No, it, it seems um, almost, it doesn't seem normal to think that physical activity wouldn't be a large contributor to your total daily energy expenditure. <laughs> it's not. One, it's not. And two, like if you actually think about it logically and break it down, you can see why it's not. Because if we're talking about five hours of exercise in a week that you know includes however many hours there is, like 160 odd. I don't know, I'm going to um, look on my calculator. It's... Uh, it's such a small component that it's not the one that we should be using to manipulate calorie balance. Right. Actually, I've never thought of explaining it like that, Dean. That's really handy. So your BMR is expending calories 24 hours a day. My calculator says 168 hours of the week. Or as I accurately put it, 160 odd. Did you? Yes. (laughs) You know, that was a pretty good stab in the dark. Um, (laughs) Stab? I quickly did some maths. 24 times 7. As you were talking, you could do the math. Yeah. You are a smarter man than me. <laughs> I still count on my fingers, guys. If the number needs to go above 10, I'm, I was counting I'm on screwed. my fingers as well, but they can't see them. And I was also inhibited by my vigorous masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I said 160 odd because a couple of fingers were stuck. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> this podcast needs to be rated uh, M15 plus at least. Uh, so where was I going with that? Yeah, no, I like the way you explain that because BMR, 24 hours a day, if you're working out one hour a day, which people aren't really training seven days a week, yeah. then we're well, only expending for that hour. Even then, if you do five hours over 170, it's like, what, 150th? Yeah. Not mm. even. No, 130th, sorry. Well, I don't know. It's the number hours. is above 10, so yeah. I can't count it on my fingers. I'm going to have to take your word for it. So anyway, <laughs> all of these things are accounted for in your total daily energy expenditure. Uh, the one that we don't really have the ability to manipulate a hell of a lot if not at all, is actually BMR. That's mm-hmm. the one that you're just sort of genetically predisposed to have. It is also going to account, uh, be accounted for in your body weight. Yeah. Uh, but we'll talk about that probably throughout this as to whether or not. Also dieting history. Either. Dieting history and a few other things. Yeah. Uh, genetics. Mm-hmm. Everyone loves to do that hashtag. Genetics. The G word. Um, but you can determine what your BMR is and also what your total daily energy expenditure is and energy expenditure is through various means. Mm -hmm. So specifically talking about BMR, like what are you metabolically capable of burning if we weren't accounting for TEF and all the rest of it? Uh TEF and meat and PAL. Yeah. Um, There's two very sciencey ways to do it, which nobody will do, (laughs) unless you're in a study that's actually testing this. And why won't they do it? Uh, Because it's just, well, one, it's expensive, two, it's time costly, and it's It's also impractical impractical and very hard to come by. So one of them is basically going to stay in a ward overnight. Your your body's going to expel its gases, and they're going to essentially determine what your resting metabolic rate is based on that. Again, no one's going to sleep in that ward. Uh, The second one is using your tube. So that would be classified as metabolic ward. The second one would be classified as metabolic cart, which is just a machine that they use and they they reference your breathing again. And that determines your resting metabolic rate or your basal metabolic rate based on gas exchange. Also impractical. Super impractical. Mm. First one's the most accurate. Second one's pretty damn accurate. The third one would be using some form of prediction equation. Mm -hmm. There's a heap of them out there. Um, The most commonly used one probably now would be Harris Benedict maybe. Um, Probably the one I see most people using. Yeah, there's heaps. Um, They can be quite technical if you wanted to work them out manually and that you have to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, But you could just literally go to Google and type in metabolic calculator and they're going to use one of the few uh, equations that are regularly used in uh, research. Positive for this is obviously it's it's accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. It's free. Everyone can do it. It's easy. You only really ever need your height and your weight. And a calculator because not everyone's as smart as you. 
No, most of them are going to have a calculator online. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Online calculators. Um, We're going to tell you the really quick equation. Or you need a nerdy friend who can do some sweet Excel with stuff. Yeah, that's true. You know, not that you would do that. Um, now, these are subject to quite a large variance. Yes, they're not as accurate. They're no. definitely not as accurate, which is why we're going to tell you how to estimate your main, your TDE, which we can think of as your maintenance calories. Mm. Because in theory, if you get your TDE right and you eat to that, because it accounts for all your energy expended, if you eat that amount of energy, you're going to maintain mm. your weight. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so mm. what these are going to typically do, though, in regards to BMR and RMR, regardless of the equations, is it's going to give you a reference point for how many calories your body needs to sustain life, not accounting for mm -hmm. physical activity right. and also uh, NEAT necessarily. Uh -huh. They'll usually then have like an activity multiplier, they'll call it, uh, and it'll be somewhere between times in your BMR of 1.2 up to probably about 2, 1.9. Depending on how active you and are. And that's going to be determined by, yeah, daily job activity, but also physical activity. Yeah. And there's some reference points there for like, whether you're, you're doing vigorous exercise four to five times per week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, okay. If you use the calculator, it'll settle this out and you can just plug it all in. Yep. That number you then get after that will be classified as your TDE. Okay. But if you wanted to do quick math as, mm. uh, what's that guy, what's his name? I don't know. He's the comedic uh, rapper. Oh. One plus one. One. Oh, anyways, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I'm not going to attempt to sing it. <laughs> it's like UK drill. Yeah, do you guys rap. know that song that's like... Um, Oh, we need to play it for you guys. All right. In post edits, we're going to play you the song. We're probably not. No, probably not. <laughs> Anyways, for, if you want to do some quick math and figure out your uh, maintenance calories on the spot, it goes like this. Females body weight in kilos times 30. If you're not very active or your body fat is quite high or up to times 35, if you are really active, I know that's... Uh, mm -hmm up for subjective, subjective yeah. measure and you're quite lean so between 30 to 35 males same deal but you're going 35 to 40 uh -huh. so that's your estimated maintenance calories if you're maintaining weight somewhere within that range you, you couldn't classify that you have a slow metabolism mm. you're you know you're within the average there will be some people who are a little lower and then we could say yeah look maybe it's a little slow and we're going to talk about what it might mean later yeah, we, after we go through the five steps. You should do bunny ears. It bunny might ears. be slow on that because yeah. it's, it's technically not, but it might be in regards to how we're referring to this, how people refer to it. Yeah. Um, and we've got some clients, well, Dean, you've got a couple of clients on 50 calories per kilo mm. of body weight. I just wrote a refeed for a client just this morning yeah. who's in a contest perhaps so way outside the norm here, gets the calories per kilogram to try and get him back to what I would perceive him to be Energy full from a muscle. Has he come off a deficit or a surplus? He's, uh, he's a in deficit. a heavy deficit. He's three yeah, weeks yeah. out okay. and, he, and he's he's really worn out. How many calories to get him what? Looking like he hasn't been dieting. For... So you're trying to fill him back up. So you're after some weight gain. but not Definitely after weight gain, yeah. Okay, I'm going to guess it's high off because of the context mm. that you've asked this question. I'm going to say 60. 80. 80 calories per kilo of body weight. Yeah. So remember, guys, we just said 30 to 35 for females, 35 to 40 for males. This guy's eating 80 calories yeah. per kilo of body weight. He had, he had done four days, five days today, back to back at 50 times. Did he used 60, to be anorexic? 60 times body weight. No. Did, he didn't used to be anorexic. At 60 times body weight and his weight shifted a kilo over five days at 50. Have you checked times. his macro tracking accuracy? No, he's good. He just has a crazy output. There's also, and, and this is actually a, an important side note, actually, yeah. is if you're referencing people's calories online as a means to determine whether or not you're slow or fast, it's just completely irrelevant. So, for example, like this individual, one, he's hypermuscular. He's 95 kilos with basically just um, essential body fat left. So that's way outside the norm for most people, you know. Um, he's not natural. Okay. He is a carpenter. Mm -hmm. oh, I know who you're talking about. He does between 21 and 25,000 steps per day, as well as... Does his name start with R? Yes. Is he an absolute legend? Yes. I know who you um, And he burns through fuel like no tomorrow. Okay. But it's mainly because of the neat part that we're talking about here. Right, because he has a really active yeah. job. Uh, and then also there's a huge anomaly when we get into the back end of a contest prep when body fat is so low that your body is deciding whether or not it wants to eat fat or eat muscle or break down tissue from bone or organ and 
there's all these things that happen and it makes the equations just, you just throw them in the bin and you have to go week by week. So. Because people who are super lean kind of break the system. They, 100%. Yeah, they don't really yeah. fit into the norm. Yeah, so I just thought it was an interesting number because I wrote it today. And it is crazy. I actually didn't look at it until after I set his calorie, his carbs today, which was 1,500 grams of carbs. <laughs> and I was like, I wonder what this is. And I was like, oh, shit. I might double check my numbers here because that's outrageous. And then I was like, no, no, no. This guy regularly, like he currently is dieting on 34 to 35 times body weight. So right, he doesn't even have to diet on low calories Yeah, relative to what he's used to. I'm going to say, God, he's so lucky. I wish that was me because I have like an average calorie tolerance and at 60 kilos, that's not a lot of food. And I sometimes I wish that it mm. was a bit higher, but I imagine it would get old really fast. Like it would be fun for a week. And then I'd be like, mm. do I have to eat this food? It certainly depends on what phase you're in from a body fat perspective. Right now, he'd be loving it. Mm. Um, but Because he's so hungry. Yeah. But yeah. in an off season, it definitely becomes quite tedious. I can't relate. Okay. So we're going to take you through five steps of testing your metabolism, at least the way that we can think about metabolism. Yes, and quickly interject. So yes. this 30 to 35 or 35 to 45, just be mindful that this is accounting for an expected TDE2, which means we're somewhat saying, hey, this is relative to your output. Right. You can technically get like a 25 times body weight or a 20 times body weight for females 20, males 25, and that would be the RMR or the BMR, mm. give or take. Again, plus or minus, there's an error margin here. And then you could multiply that by a... 1.1 or a 1.5 like the activity. Just trying to keep it simple. But it's just way too much effort. And yeah. our experience has been that most people fall within this range of five points Yeah. Uh, and that very few fall outside what we classify as the bell curve. So like if there's an upside down U, most people fall in the middle. Uh -huh. Some people fall to the left of the U. Some people fall to the right of the U. But not very Some many. people like Mr. R, we just spoke about, is way outside the U. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's the whole, he's a couple of letters down the alphabet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is accounting for some level of energy. Experience. We're assuming that you don't sit in a wheelchair all day. We're assuming yeah. that like, you know, you do between six and 12,000 steps a day yeah. and that you train about three days a week. Or and they're actually the, the good reference points. Like the, the start of that range, 30 or 35 would be like, you know, doing somewhere around sub 8,000 steps per day, not really active in your work. Yeah. And you might train three days per week. Yeah. The 35 and the 40 might be 10 to 15,000 steps. Training four, five training days four to five days yeah. per week, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, maybe have an active job. Just a little bit of common sense. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think so. But it was definitely worth outlining. Yes. Okay, so the five steps. Estimate your TDE, which we just went through. Uh, it's not enough just to estimate it. You need to actually go ahead and eat to it for a period of time, okay? Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Well, the next step, step number two of five, would be to split those calories into appropriate macros or at the very least split them into protein and the rest can go to carbs and fats as you please. Um, if you have the macro tracking course, you'll know exactly how to do that. A really rough guide here, we won't get bogged down in any details, is just go your body weight times two, yeah, anywhere between 1.6 to two thereabouts to get your protein target. So I'm 60 kilos. Actually, I jumped on the scales the other day. I was like 57 or 58. Mm. Oops. Anyways. Um, I'm 60 kilos times that by two, I would be eating 120 grams of protein a day. Okay. And we know that one gram of protein has four calories. So I would just go 120 times four to give me the calories that are taken up there. The remainder of my calories can go to carbs and fats as I please. If you wanted to set fats, you could do that as well, but I feel like it's just too many numbers for a podcast. Mm. So I'm not going to do that. You want to eat your calorie targets. You could use chronometer. You could use my fitness pal. You could use calorie King. There's a few different ways that you could go ahead and track your food. Mm. Keep in mind though, that there are for each system that you use chronometer, my fitness pal, calorie King, some flaws and inaccuracies that mean you might not actually be eating the macros that you think you are. Mm. Again, macro tracking course will clear all of that up and show you what the problems are and, and the solutions. Um, but that's, Step number two. But it's also why we have step number three. Yeah. Because regardless of the method you use. There's going to be some problems. Step number three is going to be set up a meal plan. Okay. Yeah. And if you eat to the meal plan, regardless if it's exactly as the macros say they are or, or 20 not, carbs out. you're at least consuming the same amount of calories if you consume the same food repeatedly for uh, three days in this instance, yeah. four days. Exactly. So step one, work out your calories. Step two, split them into macros or at least protein and calories. 
Step three, sort yourself out a meal plan you can be consistent with, but within a flexible framework. So what I mean by that is we're asking people to eat to the same macros for between two and four weeks to see how your weight trends over that period of time. I actually think two weeks is too short, but I'm trying to be practical here because people might not actually want to do this for longer. But two weeks is a bare minimum. I don't see anyone eating exactly the same fruit every day, exactly the same meat every day, exactly the same vegetables every day, and you don't need to. But what would be very helpful is if you're eating consistently with little tweaks within that framework. So maybe you want to swap instead of having 20 grams of carbs from apple, maybe you want to have 20 grams of carbs from watermelon instead. The amount of watermelon you can eat is more than apple because watermelon has fewer carbs. Um, Or maybe you want to swap your chicken breast for turkey breast, just making sure protein and, and calories are matched. Or maybe you want to swap your vegetable types around. That's okay too, but that's not really going to change food volume, um, sodium intake, calories. All of those things are the same because we're sticking to the framework. Mm-hmm. We're just being flexible within it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I would say like, you know, w- with any of these things, there's a, a level of detail that you can manipulate depending on how much time you have and whether or not doing things repeatedly bother you. Mm. So like we could say like in step two, for example, Which set it up with macros. protein and calories or with protein, carb, fat targets, that if you wanted to test this out in regards to how your body responds to a certain calorie limit uh, as quick as possible, then eating the exact same food to the exact same macros day in, day out would be the best approach because then there's no variability in how much food goes into your belly from a weight perspective, like you said, no change in sodium content, electrolytes. It's just very consistent. And that's like a really good quality scientific experiment, like we said. Yeah. The reason we want to do that though, can I just mention, is because we're reducing noise on the scale for those not watching on YouTube. I did the air quotes. And what that means is we know that body fat changes are only one thing that affect your body weight. Your body weight is also affected by other things. But what we're trying to do here is test your body fat changed. Are you losing fat or are you gaining fat on these estimated maintenance calories? And when we have all this other noise, your weight's being impacted by the volume of food in your gut, your hydration status, things like that. It just makes it really difficult to understand what's going on. Yeah. So I think like from a research perspective, they usually make dietary changes like once every fourth day, if something has changed, which we'll get to the next steps later Mm -hmm. on. But you've got to appreciate that these are typically highly controlled. Yes. So they are same food, same macros, no change in fluids, everything's identical, same output, you name it. Yeah. Uh, but for most people that are not living the life of r- r- repetitiveness like that, then we may extend this out, like we said, to a week or whatever it may be. You know, At least two. It could be longer. I mean, fat loss or fat manipulation is the slowest uh, factor that's going to change in regards to scale weight when everything else is created equal. Well, muscle mass would be the slowest. Well, I mean, in this instance, when we're trying to ma- look at maintenance loss, right, you maybe. are right, yes, muscle mass yeah. would be slower than fat, but... If we're saying like, are you losing fat or gaining fat from a scale perspective? All oh, right, that happens slower than hydration, or if you just did a poop. And in three yeah. days, it's, you're not going to be able to tell whether or not you're up or down in three days, no. really technically that well. So, no. um, so yeah, set yourself the meal plan. Choose how accurate you want to be. Just understand that the accuracy will also potentially dictate how long you need to sustain that protein and calorie intake in order to determine whether or not you are in a surplus, a deficit, or at maintenance. Yeah. So you're saying the more accurate somebody is the less time they need to do this. Yes, you can figure this out. That's fair. Okay. Mm. So step number four is to take your weight and get an average. So you don't want to weigh on Monday and then on Tuesday you're 500 grams up and you're like, oh, fuck, I've gained 500 grams of fat. It doesn't, like Dean said, it doesn't happen that quickly. You want to be taking your weight every day if it doesn't screw with your head. or And if it does screw with your head, maybe this isn't for you. Don't Mm. do this. Um, At three consecutive days of the week, is what I would recommend. And then you want to get an average of that. So you get an average, then the following week, you get an average again, three consecutive days of the week and see how that changes. And then the third week and the fourth week. So if you, you know, up hundred grams, down 200 grams, up hundred grams, the average over those three weeks would be absolute maintenance, Mm. right? Whereas if you were down hundred grams, down 200 grams and then the same, the average would be a 300 gram loss. So really you're able to eat a little more, like some more calories than what you originally, maybe not a lot, um, what you originally estimated. Mm -hmm. Yep. And likewise in reverse, if your weight's going up, means you're in a surplus. 
Yeah. So if you don't want to continue to go up, you're going to have to reduce some food. Yeah, you know, your caloric tolerance is a little less than the estimation. Yep. And number five, step five, is to, I think we sort of just went over it by accident, compare the week-to-week uh, averages and from there make some conclusions. And we're going to take you through three ways you can interpret this conclusion in just a moment. Hmm. But maybe we should summarise. Cool. So estimate TDE using an equation of some description. We're going to say 30 to 35 for females times your body weight in kilograms. 35 to 40 for 35 males. 35 to 40 to 40 for males. We're then going to determine our macronutrients or just our protein and calorie targets. So set a meal plan, doing so. Which is number three. Which is number three. Repeat that meal plan either very monotonously or within a flexible framework, as Liz mentioned. Number four would be to get at least three consecutive days per week of body weight weigh-ins first thing in the morning after you do the pee-pee and the Mm -hmm. (laughs) poo-poo. Yeah, I didn't mention that. It should be like you don't want to do it with shoes one day and no shoes. Yeah, or end of the day because, again, this puts more noise. into First thing in the morning, before food, after a poop. And then we're going to compare week to week if we're plus body weight, surplus, minus body weight, deficit, neutral body weight, maintenance. Exactly. And there's going to be some variability of 100, 200 grams here, there. So that's why we're kind of looking at this general average, a general trend downwards, a general trend upwards, or a general general trend somewhere in the middle. Not not exactly the same each week. Yeah, yeah. All right. So how might we interpret this? We just gave one um, way that we could interpret it, that if your body weight was trending down, it means that Actually, you can your caloric tolerance is a little more than you estimated. If it's trending up, it's a little less. If it's exactly the same, hey, you were bang on. Mm, But what happens if I do this, Liz, and mine comes back at 28 times body weight? Well, if it is the case that you're like, I really do have a slow metabolism, it might just mean that you're way less active than the assumptions behind this equation. Mm -hmm. So as we said in the beginning, if Dean was like, look, I'm not very active, I'll go 35 times body weight because I'm a male. That's like the lower end of the average. And he's gained weight on that. The conclusion might not be I have a slow metabolism. The conclusion might be I'm sedentary. I don't move around enough. So really he should be more like 30 times body weight or he should move more. Yeah. I would argue the latter in this instance, he should move more. Uh, because if he is sedentary, there's going to be huge benefits to his creativity, his focus, his energy, his mood, his health, um, if he is more active. Mm-hmm. It may also mean that I just need to take my watch off during vigorous masturbation because I'm not actually <laughs> doing 12,000 steps. I'm really only doing 8,000. Well, so that's a 4,000 step session. Mm. Wow. That's, that's a yeah. lot. Good for you. Good all, for all you, Dean. to think about, guys. Good for you. Um, The second way that we might want to interpret this conclusion, if you think, oh, shit, I I can't eat as many calories as I originally estimated, um, or the other way around, is that there is other factors affecting your scale weight, as we mentioned. Uh, Maybe you weren't as consistent on the meal plan during this testing phase as you might have wanted to be. Maybe you were eating, you know, not very many carbs in the beginning, and then in the final week, you gave way fewer calories to fats and way more to carbs, which is going to increase the scale. So it doesn't mean it's fat gain. It's just weight gain, glycogen. Um, Maybe you were constipated Mm -hmm. one week and then you were heavier on the scales because of that. Like we're only using weight as a proxy to determine body fat loss or gain. It's, yeah. And it's usually a proxy over a long period of time. Uh Uh-huh, right, exactly. Like from day to day, we're certainly not using it. From week to week, it's like this is kind of interesting. Month to month. month, month, If we're seeing a weight trend down, we can probably then suggest that it's it's coming from body fat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Because all it is is just a measurement of your body and gravity on that particular scale. Mm. Um, And like you said, so we've got constipation, we've got changes in food volume, changes in hydration status. Uh, changes in even fluid retention if you've entered into a new training program. Like maybe you've done this test at the beginning of a period where you're highly motivated to train and you trained harder this week or for two weeks and then there's some additional inflammation or maybe, you've si- maybe you're sick, maybe you got that day COVID. Maybe. You know, all of these things play into scale weight potentially. So you still may not have a quote-unquote slow metabolism. You may just have other factors that are impacting scale weight. Mm. And so maybe this is a good time to bring up the fact that if you do want to go ahead and and test this, you want to be as consistent as possible. You don't want to do it, you know, maybe you want to do it in the middle of a training program. 
not at the beginning leading into increased volume. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't want to do it when your sleep schedule is all over the place. You want to be consistent with that. You know, there's, there's some, you want to have an even playing field here across yeah. multiple areas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the third and final conclusion that we may draw from somebody who's outside of those ranges. That you actually do have a lower caloric tolerance. I, I Look, I'm trying to avoid saying slow metabolism. It. <laughs> it's true, though. You do have a lower tolerance. Lower tolerance to calories. Um, maybe you do. It could be why? Genetics? Genetics. Mm. Previous diet history. Yeah. Um, so somebody who has crash dieted. There's some really interesting studies from the, um, the biggest loser participants. Uh, how those insanely severe calorie deficits impacted their BMR, which we already know is the largest piece of the pie when it comes to yeah. energy expenditure. Um, how their BMR B yeah BMR. I just wanted to say BMI, and I was like, no, not BMI, BMR um, plummeted disproportionately to their body weight loss. Yeah. So as body weight goes down, it makes sense that BMR goes down because a smaller fuel tank requires less fuel. Um, to keep yeah, going. and the largest determinants of BMR in those equations is your body, is your weight. body weight. Yeah. yeah, so it's not like their body weight went down and their sort of BMR went down parallel with that. It was like BMR plummeted as body weight went down. Um, because ethics exist, it's not like we can just get a group of people who are like, we're going to see how much we can fuck up your BMR. But because people were already doing this, it was tested. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, di the dieting factor might influence the diet history, I should say, might influence your caloric tolerance yeah and scarily it often gets it compounds this so is why we don't want to go your diet yeah. this is why we dislike those six eight twelve week gym challenges so much because they encourage rapid weight loss and then people mm. can't sustain the methods because they're so extreme and they gain weight again mm -hmm. they've lost muscle in the process of losing weight by the way um, and then they do it again. The next gym challenge comes around. They feel motivated. They do this again. So yeah, it does it compounds. Yeah. It's, it's funny massive. how the, the, the concept of severe calorie restriction doesn't set alarm bells. It should. That's a red flag. <laughs> when the word severe, Run. if I said to you, can I give you a severe burn? You'd be like, fuck no. I don't think so. <laughs> I would say no to any type of burn, you know? to be fair. But, but if I was <laughs> to say, all right, I've got, you've got two options. I can severely burn you with the tip of a cotton bud, <laughs> like the size of it, right? Mm -hmm. Super small. Or I can do it with uh, a 600 mil water bottle size. Which would you prefer? Like I could tolerate the severity of a burn that's only small, e.g. severe caloric restriction for this short period, like two weeks, right? Yeah. Versus repeated severe restriction time and time over again, which is what we're kind of talking about in regards to the compounding effect here is that rapid fat loss done repetitively over years and years and years and years and years, and, years damage. and this sort of cyclical approach to up and down causes damage mm. catches up to you because as people lose weight as i mentioned before they're losing muscle yeah. and when they gain weight back they're probably not gaining muscle mm. they you know they're gaining the fat back so now their body composition is worse than when they started they do this again in the cycle yeah. it itself. Um, that yeah. is just an important side that like body composition definitely is factored into your BMR and that the greater amount of lean tissue. So all tissue, not including fat mass, technically speaking, will be more metabolically active and you will burn more calories. If we had like a like for like person mm -hmm. as in both 70 kilos, but severely different um, body composition, body one person's quite fat. One's really lean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the word severe is important there too, because although mu muscle is metabolically more active than fat mass, unless you can drastically change the quantity of muscle in your physique, like I'm talking 10 and 15 kilos on and difference, it's not going to drastically change your BMR or RMR. No. What will is more so the dieting history mm. and less to do with even the the, uh, the metabolic association. With and let's not forget uh, somebody who is uh, has a leaner body composition. It might not be by accident. It might be because they actually have expended many more calories in order to get that muscle in the first place too. So it's not just body composition, but it's also their expenditure yeah. is higher. And yeah, without mm. rabbit holing, you can even also think about the fact that someone who is typically leaner and has more muscle after years and years has got generally speaking, like we're going to have certain behaviors on a day-to-day -day basis, like being more active, not being sedentary, sleeping more, sleeping food more, prepping, food quality over food quantity, all these yeah. things come into play. So you know, they're not, it's not a, a, an easy comparison to make or a fair comparison, I should say, not easy. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I hope that's been helpful. Maybe we'll summarize one more time. We want to estimate your maintenance calories or your TDE, split those calories into appropriate macronutrients, set a meal plan to those macros, and you can use various apps to do that. Get your weekly weight average 
Number five, compare those averages and make conclusions from there. And the three conclusions that we could draw here is that maybe you're less active or more active than the assumptions within that equation. Um, maybe there were more factors affecting the scale. There was lots of noise on the scale outside of fat loss and gain. Or three, maybe your genetic factors or your dieting history have impacted your caloric tolerance in either direction. So for that reason that you can't control now, there's nothing you can do about your dieting history. There's certainly nothing you can do about your genetics. You do just need to eat a little less or a little more than the average person. It doesn't mean that weight management is outside of your control. It just means you might need to work a little bit harder for it. But the cool thing here is you have a fair, true, and relatively accurate indication as to like where you are currently situated from a calorie perspective, which means you now have control. Uh, as opposed to just saying, I have a slow metabolism and not understanding all these factors. And then basically, you know, um, uh, I was going to say disenfranchising yourself, that's wrong, but I was like disempowering, wrong. disempowering yourself okay. from having the opportunity to you. make change. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make change when you know. Mm. You know? What is it? Knowledge is power when applied? Something well, like it's let's make this the less shit tip. So we're going to move on to our four little segments at the end, starting with a how to be less shit tip. Um, I think the saying, and, and this is my tip, mm. if you don't mind me giving the mm. tip today, the saying is knowledge is power. I don't like that saying because I don't think that's true. I think a lot of people have the knowledge that they should eat less chips and more vegetables. That's not power. Knowledge when applied is power. Mm. Action taken on knowledge is power. I don't know, however you want to spin it. So that would be my less shit tip. If you know something and you think it's practical and reasonable and helpful and it's the lowest hanging fruit, apply it. Mm. That's how I think we can all be less shit. Apply what you know. God damn it. Well, that's a yeah, that's a feasible tip too. Thank you. Thank you, mm. Dean. Something we're sharing. You've also got this one today. Okay. I believe. Yeah. At the beginning of the episode, we decided who was going to give the something we're sharing. I today, friends of the podcast, would like to share a new app with you. Um, as you probably already do know, because I talk about books a lot, I'm a big reader. And often I'll read about a book and I'd be like, that sounds sick. And I read it and I was like, that book wasn't for me. That wasn't like helpful. It was like, what was going on there? But done on the sales pitch. I want those five hours of my life back. But look, no one's going to return the five hours. I didn't keep the receipt. And sometimes I'll read a book that I'm like, oh, we'll see. Look, people have said good things about this book, but I don't think I'm going to like it. And I'll read it and I'll be like, that was the best book of my life. That changed my view on this, this, and this. Amazing. But I found this app recently called Headway. For those looking for the icon, it's a square with blue at the top, yellow at the bottom, with like a white ladder in the middle, Headway. And um, I think there's lots of things you can do in the app, but what I've started on is book summaries. So I'm choosing like uh, categories that interest me. So it might be like science, nutrition, personal development, for example, philosophy. And there's books within those categories. And I was like, I want to hear a 15 minute summary of this book and I'll listen to it. And I'll be like, I need to read this book. Incredible. And I'll listen to another one that I'm like, yes, that sounds epic. I was like, oh, that's all about people with OCD. I'm so glad I didn't spend hours reading that book. So something we're sharing, the app called Headway, which I do think is more than just book summaries, but that's all I've gotten out of it so far, which I think is worth a subscription fee by itself. Sounds good. It sounds low, like you may have people saying they've read books like people say they've read research when all they do is read the abstract. Oh, no, no, no. No, I'm just saying people will yes, definitely do they, that. Yes, they might do that. I, I encourage you to use this just to help guide your book selection. Don't just listen to it and be like, oh, yeah, I know everything the book says now because it's not the same. Like, imagine well, imagine it's still somebody's interpretation of that book. That's true. Right. But imagine listening to a five-minute summary of this podcast. Like you can only say so much. Yeah. Mm. True story. True story. Okay, All right. Dean, next one. What are we at? We are... Oh, man. It worked this time. Yeah, you guys have to watch on YouTube. I did an, the most amazing dance to that song. We are at the section where we're going to talk about a hot topic. Mm. We're going to bring up some, something controversial. I'm going to ask Dean. He, he hasn't heard this question yet. 
this is something I'm just going to ask you now. And he's going to tell me his opinion. And these are the sorts of questions that are not just controversial, but are subjective. There is no right or wrong. Um, Dean, my question mm. to you is... I'm, going to, I'm just going to preface this and say, yeah. I'm going to try and not shoot from the hip like I normally do. Okay. I'm going to try and take a moment to critically think about my answer. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Awkward silence incoming. <laughs> no. I should have said this into the mirror first before the podcast so I actually can, can word this correctly. So we know the placebo effect is when somebody believes something is going to have a positive impact. Um, there's no reason that it does outside of the fact that they believe it. We also have something called the nocebo effect, which is the same thing but the opposite. If somebody thinks that something is going to have a negative impact, it will for no other reason than they think it will. An example would be if somebody thinks sugar is going to give them a headache and they drink something with sugar in it, the sugar didn't give them the headache. The belief that the sugar was going to give them the headache actually gave them the damn headache, right? They're not faking the symptoms. They feel it, but because belief is so powerful, no SIBO. Mm. So my question to you, Dean. This is laughing like parents going, don't give Johnny red cordial. It makes him hyper. makes him hyper and he hears mum and he's like, give me the red cordial. <laughs> I need energy. Um, okay, so we know that there's some negative dieting symptoms. Some people are like in week two of a moderate calorie deficit. And we would think, you're not going to feel these dieting symptoms. Like you're not going to be hungry. You're not going to feel lethargic yet. Like, bro, you're still 25% body fat. Mm -hmm. Like you need to at least lose 50% of your body fat in order to feel these negative effects of dieting. Okay. Um, but we know some people are just a little bit more sensitive than others. As coaches, I'm getting to my question in a moment. I'm just setting it up. As coaches, it's often helpful um, to tell clients what they're in for. Actually, it's ethically required to gain informed consent to say to the clients, oh, this is what you want to do. No worries. These are the things that may occur as a consequence. Are you willing to pay that price? Yes, I am. This Here's my question. Because of the nocebo effect, but also the fact that we have an ethical obligation to receive informed consent from our clients. Mm -hmm. Do you think that coaches should be highlighting the probable risks of a calorie deficit, for example? Because if you say to a client, hey, you're going to feel so great on this um, meal plan that I've written you, you're going to lose weight, you're going to feel fantastic, they're less likely to pay attention to the fact that they might be a little bit more tired, that maybe they're a bit more food focused. But if you tell, if you, you know, really highlight what they're in for, maybe they'll pay more attention to those things and have a harder time. Mm -hmm. What do you think you should do as a coach? I think that if the diet strategy that you intend to implement as a coach will likely have physiological repercussions, that it is ethically your duty duty to mm -hmm. provide information on what they may expect from a you know a pros and cons list or a contraindications to doing this so that they can provide you with informed consent uh -huh. on the strategy you're about to take okay if however the dietary manipulation or energy manipulation whatever you're about to make is more so likely to cause subjective perception changes okay of an individual's tolerance to the dieting strategy, then I don't think that you are. it is your ethical duty to necessarily proactively warn them of those. Can you give me an example of the latter? Yeah. So like the, the two greatest examples I think would be option, uh, in example A would be a 50% reduction in calories to achieve maximum fat loss in the shortest amount of time done for an extended period more than what you would typically do it for. Let's just pick a number and say Rapid six Rapid fat weeks. loss for six weeks. Okay. Yeah. There's definitely going to be some physiological repercussions there. If we're talking about a female, we're also potentially now like really starting to impact other things too outside of just the general physiological stuff we're talking about with menstrual cycle dysregulation and all that kind of jazz, right? Okay. Um, it's up to you to inform them of what the repercussions of that dieting strategy may cause so that they can make that choice. Uh, if you put them on a 500 calorie deficit though. Which is mild. Mild. Yeah, 500 calories less than Or to use the same scenario, let's just pick 15%. Okay, 15%. Um, you know, the, the average expectation is that most people will require somewhere around a 20 plus percent uh, on average uh, calorie restriction to start getting at least measurable fat loss, you know. Then 
there is likely going to be no long-term issues in regards to the physiological. Uh, maybe even acute. Mm. Acutely, they still may get some. Maybe, right? but maybe not. But nothing that is going to be long-lasting. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's necessarily an advantage nor your ethical duty to, to tell them uh, at 15% deficit you're going to get you know, you're going to be hungry, you're going to have this increased drive for food. Okay, so you so think so. that the line is drawn at the likelihood of um, symptoms experienced, right? So, Especially like, Especially when the symptoms are less reversible at speed. Okay. So, like, you know, you dump someone into a massive deficit, it's going to take longer to get them out of that. Um, there's, there's potentially a whole bunch of behavioural issues then too because we're going to have to restrict a restriction food. mindset. Yeah. Uh, I think the greater the potential consequences of the diet, the, the greater the, the duty of the, the coach to do so, to, to inform them that is of what's, what's coming. And then they can have a, a conversation around like whether or not the client wants to go there for that. Okay, so just so I'm clear, you're saying that it's a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. Like the, the more severe the symptoms, and I think probably also the more likely someone is to experience these symptoms, the higher your ethical duty to gather informed consent. Mm -hmm. But if you think that the consequences or the likelihood of the symptoms are low, maybe it's better that we don't because otherwise all we're doing is drawing people's attention to the negative symptoms. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, and also whether or not the symptoms are typically more transient and that they come and go with changes in diet changes. Okay. Or whether or not they're more chronic in that they still exist in the absence of the same restriction of calories for a point in time. Right. You know, so because, someone yeah. increases their calories back to maintenance, but they still have this uh, yeah. food focus that won't go away. They're yeah. always thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. Whereas if we've dieted someone for three weeks, they're a little bit hungry, put food back in for two days, they they're typically get rid of all of that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah. It's just, it's just difficult because like on a sliding scale, there's so much gray in the middle. Like where is that line? Mm. And um, especially because it's not just, okay, a 20% calorie deficit probably don't need to warn them because we're just going to draw their attention to these things at 20, uh, you know, 25, probably don't need to 30, probably to 35%. Yes, we should do it there. But people's response and tolerance is different at different deficits. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, it's well, not, it's not just drawing a line at a number, not at 34, but yes, at 35, but also like, where does this person sit on the scale? Yeah. But I also think this is, a sliding scale in regards to when the consent may change as well in that if you're accumulating appropriate data from week to week, both their subjective opinions on their hunger, their energy, their mood, their libido, all these sorts of things. Uh -huh. And you're also looking at their metrics from a little bit more of an objective perspective, like their body weight, their energy, uh, like their performance, sleep, um, yeah. sleep, all these kinds of things. If we're starting to see trends in a negative direction, then it's super important. You pull up stumps for a moment and say, Hey, this is what I'm seeing as a coach. How you are know, you feeling? I can see that you're also experiencing this because you've mentioned X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Let me talk to you about what the consequences would be if we continue down this route. Yeah. Okay. You know, and that may that may happen throughout the entire process. Mm. So, but I think if the initial the initial change is within what we would classify to be like a you know healthy sustainable range of calorie restriction, and we're setting them up with all the right behaviors, and those symptoms that you mentioned are more about perception than reality from a physiological perspective, then I don't necessarily think it would be advantageous to forewarn them. Yeah, okay. Um, but I'm also okay with doing that. This is also, again, probably a part of your onboarding process where you ask this individual how they, you know, manage information the best. Like, do they like to be told or do they just like to do or, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've always kind of struggled with this question. I've never spoken to anyone about it out loud because, as you can see, I found it hard to put into words because there's a lot of things to consider. But um, I, I like to have all the information, but I wonder if I, like, for example, I'm looking to get LASIK eye surgery soon, maybe Monday, the day that this podcast gets published. Um, I don't know if I want to know that maybe I'll have like dry eyes. I do because I like read everything that I could, but maybe I'd rather have just done it. And then I might not even notice slightly dry eyes. I might not have noticed that I have like blurry vision around bright lights maybe I would have just gotten on with it. But because I know all the symptoms that I might experience, I might be focusing on them and being like, damn it, like there's so many drawbacks of this thing. Hmm. But I suppose like do you know that you're a catastrophizer versus not? Or, oh, I'm not know, a catastrophizer. Or you're a logical reasoner and so on. Because the flip of that question, the, the flip of that answer could be is that maybe you're not expecting dry eyes and then you get them and then you think, Well, oh, I am expecting them now. No, but no, but then you think, I oh, read that I problem. should. 
Yeah. So now, now that because you didn't come in with the, the information, information, you now not catastrophize, but maybe like I think there's know, an issue. Think there's problems, and there's really just it's just normal. Yeah. And then you know, so it really will depend on I think your personality type as to if you're a person seeking information. So here's yeah. here's one for the coaches. I, I've given my opinion on the coaches there, but I think if you're a listener who's going to be a client to somebody, it's really important that you ask yourself how you tolerate information or how you process information that could be positive, negative, and or neutral around like somebody telling you what to expect. And if you are somebody who does get lost down the rabbit hole of the negatives, like focusing on, on your hunger, like, oh, whenever I'm hungry, everything's the worst, then, then maybe inform the coach before that, before that decision's made. Yeah. You know, like if you know what you respond. Like for me, I'm like kind of an in spite of kind of guy. Like you tell me I'll be hungry, guess what I'm going to do every time that I'm hungry? I'm just going to say I'm not hungry and I'm just going to get on with it. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas other people might be the opposite. You give them the option to say they're hungry and they're like, oh, I'm hungry. I've and got to eat. You know? Mm. So. God, a good coach has a hard job. There's so much to consider. Mm. Like the numpties out there that are just handing out meal plans. They don't know what being a good coach is. Honestly, there's so much to think about. There's yeah. so much. To, but it's also important not to get paralysis by analysis. Like as a coach, not to sit there and um, let inaction ruin you because there's just too much to consider just consider your options take the best step at the time and you know upon reflection you might be like look i could do it better next time and we can always take lessons from mistakes mm -hmm. yeah cool final Ooh. segment would you rather Ooh. you want for me or do i am i doing your would you rather all right would you rather Mm -hmm. maintain your current level of blindness. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have very bad eyesight, like terrible. For the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. For anybody that knows prescriptions, I'm nearsighted, so I can't see objects that are far away. And my prescription is minus 3.5. So I could read a book that's maybe 30 centimetres away from my face, but like 32 centimetres. If you're three. lucky. Yeah, no, I'm, it's terrible. So Go maintain on. your current level of blindness, which is blind as fuck. Blind. For the next 10 years with no uh, intervention possible to fix it? Oh, no, whatever the alternative mm. is because I can't. Or mm. have your eyes fixed tomorrow, mm -hmm. but you will have dry and weepy eyes. Dry and weepy? Yeah, like conjunctivitis Oh, for a month. Oh, definitely that one anyways. Still a month. Yeah. I'll just wear sunnies everywhere. No, no, no. I can't so how would your others work? You okay, know this. Right. You've got to embrace the suck. I'm embracing the month of like junky eyes. What would have to happen for that month for that to change your opinion on a 10 year thing? Because I mean, you just wear glasses and contact lenses, like you always have. Okay, so like a month of conjunctivitis eyes. Yep. And you can't read books because they're too close and they make you conjunctivitis. Whatever. Turn I'm into taking a river. the worst month of my life, whatever that is. Complete I'm blindness taking... for a month. Yeah, I'd rather be blind for a month. Actually? Yeah. I'm not helping you. Oh, well, fuck. We've got, I'll gotta, pay someone to help me. Look, accept my answer and move on. We're going, you, if you're going to get this done on Monday, yeah. that means you still have to get yourself out of this apartment that you mentioned has eight floors I'll with your someone. 35 kilo suitcase. I'll pay someone. How, where will you find your wallet? I'm not helping you. I'm figuring it out, Dean. This is my answer. Accept it. That's what I'm doing. I'll be blind for a month. You don't know which direction to walk on the street with your eyes. No, it's true. I have no sense. How did you do blind? I have no sense of direction whatever, like whatsoever. It's terrible. I was not born with an internal compass. Um, okay. On that note, thanks for watching YouTubers. Thanks for listening here, people. Mm. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. We will still be in Istanbul in the next episode. Ooh, I don't think so. Yeah, actually, we've got Chelsea coming up in the next episode and we will be in Istanbul. Oh, we will. I thought you meant for our, uh, just ours. For the one without a guest. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not a guest. We might be back in London just for a week. Yeah, we're going back to London to um, see one of Dean's clients' bodybuilding shows and also flex coach George is getting Ooh. on stage. So we're going to see his final show for the season and then we get to have a meal out with him after. Yeah, we're going to nibble on some ribs. It will be fabulous. All Thanks, right. everyone. Bye. See ya.